I'm thankful to Cindy for the opportunity to speak at Spark. I'm thankful to the West Huntsville elders for allowing Spark to be a part of our spiritual nourishment. And I'm so very thankful to our Father for helping me to grow so that I can rejoice in suffering. I believe one of the most beautiful invitations recorded in God's Word is found in Matthew 11, 28-30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We know and understand that Jesus Christ in this instance was offering an invitation that would lead to salvation of souls. We also know that the only way that we can access the Father is through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 14, 6, as Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Acts 4.12 tells us, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And verse 10 tells us that Peter was speaking about Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Within this invitation is a basis for digging deep in God's word. Take my yoke up on you and learn from me. King James says, learn of me. In a very true sense, this is what digging deep is all about. Learning about or from Christ. Therefore, according to scripture, if we are learning of Christ, we are also learning of the Father. Jesus told Philip in John 14, 7 through 10, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I not been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. There is no better time to dig into God's word than when we are faced with desperate times. And a study of digging deep in God's word is a meaningful way to do this. Studying his word in this way puts us in close touch with our Father and gives us the chance to understand just how he works to care for us and bless us during those desperate times. There are two ways in which we access communication with our Father. Our communication to Him is through the prayers that we offer up to Him. In turn, He communicates with us through His Word. It takes both of these to maintain a balance in our spiritual lives. Participating in digging deep in God's Word is a viable way in which we can grow in both of these areas of communication. If you will permit me to share a personal narrative, I will attempt to give some background into possibly why Cindy asked me to talk to you about digging deep in for desperate days. Early April of 2020, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. My oncologist explained that stage four cancer meant that the cancer had already metastasized to various organs in my body. In my case, my lymph nodes, both my lungs, and my liver 
were infected with the cancer. If I chose not to have treatment, it would be fatal in a matter of months. If I accepted treatment, he could offer me three to five years more of life. Three weeks before this, I had very foolishly related to a friend that I would never undergo chemo treatments. I now understand that that was in the nature of the foolish talking that Paul warned about in Ephesians 5, 4. I based my remarks on the suffering of my sister-in-law that I had witnessed almost 20 years before. Treatment has changed somewhat in the intervening years. When the doctor told me my chances, I did not hesitate. I turned to my husband, I placed my hand on his knee, and I said, for three to five more years with him, I will do that. Needless to say, my husband and I left the doctor's office in shock. When we arrived at home, we sat down to talk and try to process what we had learned. We cried together, we prayed together, and we sought counsel from a brother that we admired and knew he would help us to accept and deal with what we were facing. In the end, I was determined that I would somehow use this experience as a means to let others see Christ living in me. The Digging Deep study for 2019-2020 was glory the lessons covered the glory of God and how it was manifested through his attributes. attributes. In the study, we also considered how Jesus glorified God while he was on earth through his preaching and the work that he did while here. In addition, the study involved Christ being glorified in the culmination of his work on earth his sacrificing himself on the cross. It was at this time that I shared with Cindy that I wanted to be able to glorify God in whatever way I could on this journey that I had embarked. If I am in any way fulfilling that hope, a part of it is due to my commitment to the Digging Deep program. I would like to share some thoughts with you about how the study of digging deep in God's Word has helped me to rejoice in suffering. Number one, digging deep in God's Word is a means to bring us to the Word of God. Studying Scripture has been a great source of comfort for me. I believe with all my heart that the only way that we can rejoice in suffering is to learn as much as we can about God and His love and to dedicate ourselves to doing His will. One of the greatest blessings in suffering is knowing that we have the greatest possible comforter. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 states, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. It may be that the comfort spoken of here is for when we suffer tribulation of a spiritual nature, but knowing how much God loves us It is hard to believe he would withhold his comfort when we are suffering from a physical standpoint. What is not stated here, but is implied, is that one way that we can access this comfort is by learning more about God, our Father. And the only way I know that we can do this is through the study of his word. As a result of being comforted by him, we then have the opportunity to comfort others who experience the same suffering. One of the greatest blessings I have received through my suffering 
is being able to talk to others who have been through what I am going through and hear how they are able to cope. The year that I joined Digging Deep, the study 2013-2014, the title of our study was Knowing God. We had opportunity to learn something of the role of each of those three in the Godhead. While studying the role of the Father in the Godhead, we learned some of the ways that he preserves and protects his children and how he pities them. During this study, I learned a lot about the compassion of our Father. It helped me to form a totally different view of his care than I had formerly believed. Knowing this about his love and care for us has helped me to face my suffering with a more positive attitude and an assurance that he is with me no matter what I face. I have experienced the love of God in so many ways through this past year. Two scriptures that I have come to rely on and believe in are Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And also Romans 8, 28, a beloved passage by many. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. That does not mean that everything that happens in our lives are going to be good. What that does mean is that whatever happens is going to work for our good, for our outcome. And that is such a wonderful promise. One of the ways that I have been comforted through the Word of God is spending time in the book of Psalms. During our Unto Thee, O Lord study in 2014-2015, we delved into the book of Psalms to see the richness within shared by various Bible characters and their relationships with God. They poured out their hearts to him in praise, thanksgiving, and petitions, just as we do in our prayers today. In keeping with my <clears throat> desire to glorify God, I especially look for those psalms that praise him, exalt him, and glorify him. In doing so, I am reminded of what a wonderful God he is and how blessed I am to be able to call him Father. A second way digging deep has helped me is when my mind is in turmoil or I experience what can sometimes be called chemo brain fog, having an organized study like digging deep helps me to focus. Knowing that I can concentrate on completing the assignments gives me a sense of accomplishment. Also, knowing that I have the digabits and the podcast to reinforce and sometimes redirect my thoughts in the study keeps me from getting too frustrated and giving up. One of my favorite studies was the study of In the Shadows. That was the 2016-2017 study. I've always been fascinated by the types and antitypes in the Bible. This gave me the chance to see how God set up his plan of salvation, but also how he used those types and antitypes to introduce all the various aspects of his plan to prepare the people and educate them in preparation for the coming of Christ. One of the types, antitypes, we studied was how the church was a type of heaven. I have had opportunity to see 
a little bit of heaven in the church this past year in the way my brothers and sisters have ministered to me. I now have a better understanding of how God uses his people to provide one another in times of need. These provisions come in the form of spiritual, physical, and material needs based on my need at the time. A third way that Digging Deep has helped is studying God's Word with the help of Digging Deep reminds me of the power and the care of our Father. During the study of the 2015-2016 study, we focused on persecution and how through persecution of his people, God was able to show his power and his care for those being persecuted. While I cannot call what I am experiencing persecution, there is a correlation between how God protected those in persecution and how he is protecting me through my situation. A great example of this is Joseph. Some might not think of this in terms of persecution. However, what Joseph's brothers did to him was in the nature of persecution, as well as what Potiphar's wife did, apparently, on a daily basis. So how did God protect Joseph? While in Potiphar's house, Genesis 39 2 through 5 tells us the Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man. Can you imagine being successful as a slave? And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had put him put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. While in prison, Jennifer 30, excuse me, Genesis 39, 21 through 33 tells us, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. The prison authority trusted Joseph and what he was doing. In Genesis 50, 20, Joseph told his brothers, but as for you, you meant evil against me but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is to this day to save many people alive. Another great example of persecution is Jeremiah. Jeremiah was persecuted as a result of the message he delivered from God. The people wanted messages that condoned what they were doing, and Jeremiah would not bow to their wishes. Jeremiah 17, 18 tells us, Let them be ashamed who persecute me, but do not let me be put to shame. Let them be dismayed, but do not let me be dismayed. Bring on them the day of doom and destroy them with double destruction. Jeremiah 20, 11, 10 and 11, but For I heard many mocking, Fear on every side. Report, they say, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watched for my stumbling, saying, Perhaps he can be induced. 
Then we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. Like Jeremiah, I can truly say, but the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Jeremiah 38, 6 through 13 tells of a time when Jeremiah was thrown into a dungeon where he was sure to die, but God provided a means of rescue through a eunuch named Ebed Melech. You will be blessed in reading this account. The next person I want to look at is Daniel. Daniel was persecuted because of jealousy. His fellow statesmen knew that the king held him in high esteem, and when he was brought to the king's attention for disobedience, even the king understood what was behind their plotting. Daniel 6, 16 and 17, So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the signets of his lord, that lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. But the king was so upset that night, he couldn't even sleep. Daniel 6, 22 through 24 tells us, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Then the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatsoever was found on him, because he believed in his God. We know Daniel's enemies were cast into the lion's den, and their bones were broken before they ever reached the bottom of the den. I wish I had time to share with you so many others who suffered persecution. We can learn a lot about rejoicing in suffering from studying incidents from the lives of those persecuted ones. For instance, Job, while we don't think of this as persecution, Satan was persecuting him to get him to curse or deny God. And wasn't that what Paul of Tarsus did to the Christians? David was at the mercy of King Saul, and King Saul wanted to kill him just because he was jealous of David. Elijah was running from Jezebel and Ahab. God had given him one of the greatest victories over the prophets of Baal. Yet, when Jezebel threatened him, he fled in terror. Nehemiah was constantly opposed by Sanballat, Tobiah, and Jessam, and they tried to stop his work. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from Nebuchadnezzar and those who were jealous of these Jew Jewish sons, they told Nebuchadnezzar, if our God is able to, to, to deliver us from then, then that's great. But even if he's not, we will not bow down to your gods. And Paul, who was persecuted primarily from Jews, in each of these instances, God ultimately took care of them. Studying these faithful lives and learning how God took care of them has helped me to realize that he is just as faithful to care for me in my distress. In many of these situations, he did not take the suffering away right away, but helped them to have strength to work through it. It is amazing the strength that I have gained from knowing this. 
our perfect example of suffering and persecution? Jesus was persecuted while teaching through harassment from the scribes, the Pharisees, priests, and elders. On two different occasions, they took up stones to stone him. But he escaped, knowing this was not the death that he would die. However, his final persecution, the father would not intervene. To do so would have voided the plan that he put into place before the creation of the world, the salvation of mankind. Number four, having the background of my studies in Digging Deep helps me to make sense of what is happening to me and how I can rely on God to see me through. Great Escapes was our study in 2017-2018. Two months of this study concentrated on the providence of God. Believing that God is providentially working things out in my life helps me to have confidence that allows me to rejoice in what he's doing in my life. I have always strongly believed in the providence of God, but I have come to a whole new understanding of his providential care. There are so many times that he has worked details out for my medical care before I was even aware that there was a need. I look back on things and realize that no way it could have happened without him. I have been blessed with some of the best doctors and health care providers, and I believe that God had a hand in those choices that were made for me. Studying Digging Deep helps me to remember that God keeps his promises. I am told that the very first Digging Deep study included an assignment with the promises of God, about the promises of God. Although I did not join the study till two years later, I have found throughout all the studies there has been a hint, if not an outright declaration, that God makes promises and he keeps those promises. This fact has a lot to do with my rejoicing in my suffering. With his help and his promise of eternal life, Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life with which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. I have put my trust in him to guide me and provide what I need to make the best of this situation. Proverbs 3-5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I have to admit that this is a work in progress for me. Sometimes I find myself trying to lean on my own understanding. I have so many meaningful examples from his word of our Father making and keeping promises that give me assurance that he will keep his promises to me. In Genesis 3.15, He made a promise to Satan that became a promise for all of mankind. Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Then, with the rainbow, God promised he would never again destroy the earth with water. Genesis 9 13 through 15, I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And listen to this, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. 
the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Then his promise to Abraham that formed the Israelite nation. He promised that he would make Abraham a great nation, a great name, and a great seed. We find this promise first in Genesis 12, 2 and 3. And then he repeated that promise to Isaac and then to Jacob. And he fulfilled that promise in the Son of God. One of Moses' promises from God in Exodus 3, 7, and 8 reads, And the Lord said, I, will, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, so I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Then he made a promise to Joshua when Joshua was given the leadership of the Israelite nation. His promise to Joshua was this and is found in Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Have you ever thought about the fact that the Lord is with us wherever we go, whatever we do, wherever we are? He made a promise to David when David wanted to build him a temple. His promise to David was, in 1 Chronicles 22, 9 and 10, Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. Remember, David was a man of war. And this was one of the reasons God would not let him build a temple. And I will give him rest from all his enemies all around. His name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. He then made an, a, a promise to the apostles just before he descended back into heaven. And that's recorded in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. He gave a promise to Paul in Acts 18, 9 and 10. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And then one of his many promises to us in 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Number six, Digging Deep provides a great support group. One of the most exciting things about Digging Deep is the knowledge that there are thousands of women engaging in the same study. There are two avenues of support built into the framework of this study. The first one, Digging Deep in God's Word. As most of you know, 
This is the Facebook page where we can communicate with one another when we have questions or suggestions relating to the monthly study. It also provides announcements and other information directly pertaining to the study. This page is dedicated solely to things related to the study. The other avenue is Digging Deep for Encouragement. This Facebook page was provided for us to communicate with one another about things that are not directly related to the study, but provide various means in which we can encourage one another. This may be in the form of prayer requests, requests for sound doctrine, excuse me, for sound congregations when we, when we travel, uh, information relating to acceptable study Bibles or other reference materials, concerns about the brotherhood, and other relevant information. For me, one of the blessings that came out of this Facebook page was having a prayer request issued for me, and not only knowing that sisters all over the world were praying for me and my situation, but also having some of those same sisters contact me with cards and letters of encouragement. To know that my name was being brought before the throne of the Almighty God by so many faithful sisters helped tremendously in my being able to rejoice in suffering. While the study of Digging Deep Lessons throughout the years was a great help in my being able to face this journey with a positive attitude, it has not always been easy. This past year has been a frustrating one for me in many ways. The chemo treatments have caused me to have a hard time focusing on anything that required deep concentration. And there are times when I was ready to give up on my studies. Often, I shared my frustration with Holly Smith and Emily Anderson as they are my study buddies. They both have been a blessing to me in so many ways, encouraging me and praying with me and for me when I could not seem to make sense of my study. I'm sharing this with you in the hopes that when you feel that you want to give up on your study, you may remember that others struggle at times. And that if you ever feel like this, please reach out to me and I will strive to be an encouragement to help you. And I think I can also say that any of the sisters engaged in the study would offer the same. We all just want to help one another to grow in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God and to be together in heaven. We are commanded to study God's Word. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved, a workman unto God that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And for me, it is one of the most rewarding things that I can do as a Christian. When I'm not able to study as I want, I feel starved. I feel out of sorts and unfulfilled. My husband would tell you that I am not an easy person to live with when I cannot study my Bible. I've often heard Cindy say publicly and privately that you do not necessarily have to participate in digging deep to study God's Word. But study. Find something that fits your style of study if digging deep does not work for you. Digging deep is a great tool, but is not the only method of study. Just as children have different learning styles, so do adults. Just get in the Word and stay in the Word. You will never regret time spent in the Word. 
the more we know about our God, the more desire we will have to be like him. There is no other way for us to learn of God but through his word. It is a wonderful gift to us from the Holy Spirit. May we use that gift to its fullest potential. May we always remember that that beautiful invitation issued by Christ Jesus in Matthew 11 involved getting to know him through the study of God's word. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light.